studies from Stanford University with a dissertation on modernism in the Viennese press. Um, the title of her talk is Finding a Common Root, the Persuasive and Literary Value of Anthropomorphism in Peter Bullenbin's uh, The Hidden Life of Trees. Uh, our next speaker will be Ben Morton, who is a lecturer in English Literature and Communication at Avondale College of Higher Education in New South Wales, Australia. Her current research interests include the ethics of storytelling and narrative nonfiction, the development of Australian literary journalism, and contemporary young adult fiction. The title of her talk is Empathy, Inquiry, and Imagination in Literary mm -hmm. uh, Isabel Neri uh, has been working as a literary journalist in Portugal for 30 years. Uh, she's the author of three books, including Prisoners, Mothers Behind Bars, and has won various journalistic prizes. The title of her talk is Neuroscience of Literary Journalism. Um, Brain reactions to media and literature. And then our last presenter will be Marie Banus, um, who's a postdoctoral researcher from the Belgian National Fund for Scientific Research. Um, she also teaches communication research methods and journalistic narratology at the University um, of de Her current research is awful, I'm sorry. Her current research concerns the, it's probably German, but, uh, um, her research concerns the uh, reception of narrative journalism, both in Belgium and the U.S. The title of her talk is Reading News as Narrative, uh, or as Inverted Pyramid, the Role of Gender on the Reading. So, so without further ado, Kate McQueen.
rhetorical device that ascribes human traits to non-human entities and objects. It's arguably our most enduring aesthetic impulse, easily found in works of artistic and religious expression from prehistory onward. It's also one of the oldest ways we've found to explain the natural world, and for a long time we held a position in our knowledge system now occupied by empirical science. Given this dual work, part aesthetic, part epistemologic, it should be unsurprising that the popularity of personification declined in proportion with the rise of modern science. As early as 1725, Jean-Baptiste Rico, in his New Science, promoted the idea that anthropomorphic language is misappropriation through misapprehension, a consequence, he wrote, of our axiom that man, in his ignorance, <coughs> makes himself the rule of the universe. With each scientific and philosophical development, literature has followed along. The more precise use of language and desire by the, and a desire by the height of realism to capture something as it really is and not as it's like. The more we knew, the more sentimental and parochial personification seemed. Victorian era critic John Ruskin famously disregarded anthropomorphism as the pathetic fallacy, linking the trope to pathos the least rational mode of persuasion. In the present day, creative writers have more or less discarded it entirely. To quote poet Galway Kimmel, 18th and 19th century po poets almost had to personify. It was like mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. The only way they could imagine to keep the world from turning into dead matter. But as post-Darwinians, it was up to us to anthropomorphize less and to vegetabilize, animalize, and mineralize ourselves more. Interestingly, Ruskin's complaint is a good part of what makes personification attractive to environmental writers today. A direct link to pathos is a strength for an author hoping to arouse feelings in an audience. Consider this statement by Wool Lady in an interview with Yale's online <coughs> environmental magazine, E360. We humans are emotional animals. We feel things, we don't just know the world intellectually. So I use words of emotion to connect with people's experience. Science often takes these words out, but then you have a language people can't relate to, that they can't understand. If you only write technically about biochemical processes, people quickly get bored and stop reading. Dr. Suzanne Simard, the forest ecologist on whose research the hidden life of trees is grounded, makes a similar argument. I have always been careful not to go beyond the data, she told the same magazine, E360. But there comes a point in time when you realize the traditional scientific method only goes so far. We need to bring in human aspects so that we understand deeper, more viscerally, what's going on in these living creatures that are not just inanimate objects. Similar arguments have been made by biologist David Haskell, whose book The Forest Unseen was shortlisted for a Pulitzer in 2015 and by MacArthur Fellow and marine ecologist Carl Spina, who believes that anthropomorphism is our best first guess at why organisms do what they do. One telling example is Will Layden's description of a mother tree suckling its young to describe the transfer of nutrients between adults and sapling trees. It's a description that fits, sits a bit oddly, the word suckle so filled with emotional intentionality a distinct form of caregiving associated with mammals. But Volleyman <coughs> rejects the biologist's description of trees pumping sugar solution through their interconnected root systems. It does not explain the ability of trees, for example, to recognize their offspring once planted, or to take into consideration the care needed to fight the wild odds of their survival. A mature peach tree, for instance, may produce more than one million beech nuts over the course of its lifetime, yet only one of these seeds is likely to grow to an adult tree. For decades, saplings are too small to photosynthesize on their own. Under the darkness of the leafy canopy, they require additional nourishment to live. What better word then, Wolayden argues, than supple to understand the care trees extend for the sake of their progeny. A few issues, I think, drive this newfound appreciation of personification as an attractive rhetorical strategy. 
First, more science writers are willing to address what scholars of literary journalism already acknowledge, that adherence to the purely objective is limiting. Grounded within scientific research, personification seems less like Vico's misappropriation and misapprehension, and more like a form of empirically established <coughs> aesthetic proof. While the mix of metaphor and data in this book feels jarring, even a bit tacky at times, it does produce a kind of aesthetic experience largely absent from scientific discourse, namely the state of wonder. Novelist John Banville makes this point in his review of The Hidden Life of Trees that appeared in the Irish Times, praising it as, and I'll quote him directly, a marvelous book. Quite literally, it is a book of marvels, unquote as he lists all the ways researchers now know trees are sentient beings. Wonder has always been a part of the broader intellectual framework of scientific research, even when it's been painfully absent from scientific tech. A technique like personification acts like a useful bridge to reconnect readers to the emotional experience of scientific discovery. It also offers readers a way to feel connected to the world around them playing on what sociobiologist Edward O. Wilson calls biophilia, an innate human urge to associate with other life forms. Bolleben is not the only, not the first uh, writer to reach out to a general audience on behalf of trees, yet he is unique in his success. The book was a runaway bestseller in Germany, as well as in the United States, and received glowing reviews from many discerning English language outlets, including the New York Times, NPR, and the New York Review strategy is not without risk. There has been some hand-wringing about the dangers of attributing to plants certain qualities that science at this stage can't entirely support, like memory and intentionality. But the book's reception indicates that audiences do want to read stories about nature, and such stories do have uh, affect readers' interests, understanding, and appreciation of the non-human life around them. There's even some evidence that Mulvaden's emotive appeal will have real-life impact. His books have already convinced some communities in Germany to abandon the use of heavy machinery entirely. After the success of Mulvaden's books, the anticipated release also of David Haskell's second book, um, The Song of the Trees, which came out last month, uh, I think it will be interesting to see if more journalists and science writers do turn to literary strategies to invigorate public discourse and policy around scientific research. At the very least, these works should remind publishers and editors that science writing can be literary and can indeed captivate an audience. Change in one's own attitudes leading to deliberate 
pro-social action. While Keynes is not disproving the empathy altruism hypothesis, her interdisciplinary study emphasizes that for fiction, there is no demonstrable link between feelings of empathy and pro-social action as yet. A key point for Keen is that a reader's perception of a text's fictionality plays a role in subsequent empathetic response by releasing readers from the obligations of self-protection through skepticism and suspicion. In other words, readers enter fictional worlds with a willing suspension of disbelief that allows them to feel a deeper sense of empathy with characters without subsequent demands to act in a pro-social way. Keen allows that readers may internalise the experience of empathy in a way that promises later real-world responsiveness to others' needs, but again emphasises that fictional worlds provide safe zones for readers feeling empathy without experiencing a resultant demand on real-world action. This freedom from obligation, she writes, paradoxically opens up the channels for both empathy and related moral effect, such as sympathy, outrage, pity, righteous indignation, and not to be underestimated, shared joy and satisfaction. So a key question here for readers of literary journalism is might real world subject matter preclude or obstruct empathetic engagement? For Keen, the answer is yes, given the protective barrier of fictionality is not at play. Um, as she writes, the fact of others' perspectives and motivations often will activate a reader's caution. But a mitigating point here is that literary journalism often uses storytelling techniques strategically to immerse readers in a narrative situation similar to those found in fiction. And each of these techniques um, invite readers into an immersive experience, empathic engagement, potentially disarming their scepticism and suspicion. As scholars and practitioners alike have noted, the use of such techniques inviting a reader's immersion trigger ethical issues between literary journalists and readers. However, for this study, the key point is that immersive techniques work both for and against empathic engagement. For, in that they may disarm scepticism and, and suspicion, and against, in that, as Keen has noted, generic and formal choices made in crafting a narrati narrative may invite or retard uh, readers' empathic responses, depending on their disposition towards or against particular formulaic conventions. Keen's point here about the protective ba barrier of fictionality may seem counterintuitive when compared with various claims that nonfiction has an inherent power to draw people's attention and elicit empathy. James Carey, for example, in the introduction to the favourite book of reportage, compares fiction with reportage, proposing that the latter lays claim directly to the power of the real, which imaginative literature can only approach through make-believe. Carey's contention, however, is tellingly followed up by a number of qualifiers. He writes, the facts presumed demand our recognition and require us to respond, though we do not know how to. <coughs> or at this level, so one would like to hope. Reportage may change its readers, may educate their sympathies, may extend in both directions their ideas about what it is to be a human being, may limit their capacity to be inhuman. For Tom Wolfe, there was a built-in interest factor because the reader knows all of this actually happened. And as a non-fiction novel, author and literary critic David Lodge writes, for the reader, the guarantee that the story is true gives it a compulsion that non-fiction can quite equal. But what each of these positions has in common is an untested assumption that readers process and re respond to non-fiction differently than to fiction. He incites a study by Michael Z. Slater that found impacts on readers' beliefs about unfamiliar social groups derived from fictional sources was equal or actually greater than that arising from non-fiction influences. A more recent study on the influence of journalistic story form, emotional response and charitable giving as pro-social behaviour found that readers were moved more by story personification, that is, an individual victim whose circumstances portrayed large-scale violence than the use of statistics or the basic news story form, there's no news for us there. Indirectly, there was a weak but significant association between reader effect and charitable giving. However, direct association between story form and charitable giving was not evident. 
Interestingly, the researchers in this 2016 study confirmed findings of three previous studies that indicate readers who were given a plan of action or mobilizing information report significantly less despair than those left without apparent solutions. But this paper concludes that there is an evident disconnect between reader effect and reader action, which requires further investigation. The linchpin, at least the first part of this equation between narrative empathy and pro-social behavior is arguably the imagination. As demonstrated in my previous paper, the imagination has various roles that are all inherently creative, be they schematizing, synthesizing, or projecting. Keen draws on the work of philosophers Susan Fagan and Ian Denwood, who write that to, empath to empathize is to imagine having the thoughts and beliefs, the desires and impulses of another. Keen observes that this is a primarily thinking or cognitive role, but that imaginative role taking produces sensations that deserve to be uh, registered as feeling. Thus, narrative empathy, produced either by fiction or nonfiction, involves a process that is both affective and cognitive, with reason and logic mediating the extent of imaginating, imaginative role taking experience and hence the uh, empathetic response. In a paper titled The Neuroscience of Empathy, Tanya Singer and Kraus Lamb observed that most contemporary neuroscientific models of empathy stress the importance of top-down control and contextual appraisal for either the generation of an empathic response or for modulating an existing one induced by automatic responses. That is to say that the roles of reason and logic are crucial in the imaginative projection. Empathy is not purely a sensory driven process in which affective states are automatically induced. The implications for literary journalism, once again, include narrative strategies that are judiciously um, chosen to represent reality in a way that promotes rather than forecloses empathic engagement. For Keane, there is no formula for this. Different readers respond differently to voice, style, genre, and levels of complexity. In literary journalism's favor, however, a num there are a number of studies on empathic engagement in fiction that found emotional experiences of literature emphasize foregrounding effects at the level of literary style that shake up conventions, slow the pace, and invite a more active reading that opens the way for empathy. Following these studies, Keane writes that unusual or striking representations in literary text open up the way for empathic reading. And here we find ourselves back at James Carey's introduction, um, where two of the eight features he writes of good reportage include avoiding the usual relations between language and reality and combating the inevitable and planned retreat of language from the real, isolating singularities that will make an account real of readers, not just something written, but something seen. While there may not yet be any empirical evidence out of a lab as available as yet to indicate that reading literary journalism results in pro-social behavior, I think Kate's paper, paper has just given us um, one very good um, example, and of course, I'm sure we can think of many, including Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, John Hersey's Hiroshima, as we've heard this week, uh, this week Rebecca Spoot's Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, all of which have undoubtedly mobilized public discourse to affect social and political change. If we can extrapolate Further, if we can extrapolate findings from neuroscience, psychological, and cognitive literary studies, then the literary and literary journalism does predispose readers to experience empathic engagement. And at the heart of this experience is the role of the imagination, first for the writer who uses the faculty to think their way into situations of differently situated others, including the marginalized, and then to re represent the world creatively, responsibly, imaginatively, and symbolically. And finally, for the reader who would identify either situationally or subjectively with the subjects of literary journalism through self-extension and imaginative role taking.
everyone. Um, my presentation will be about this um, difficult area of neurosciences and literary journalism. It started off because um, I wanted to find some answers. I'm a journalist and I, at a certain point, uh, noticed that uh, what I wanted to do it as a journalist wasn't the same that what my uh, chief wanted me to do. Not, not direct chief, but uh, people who made the decisions wanted me to do. And I had this feeling that this wasn't right even in terms of neurosciences, because uh, neurosciences already help a little bit to know what's going on in our brains when we read and what we, what we feel. But in practice, I didn't find um, studies about the um, reaction of the brain and literary journalism. So I had, I had to uh, go a little bit around the issue uh, and try to make parallels. Uh, but I think this could be a very interesting topic to be studied. Uh, first of all, one of the studies uh, I found, which I think is very interesting, is uh, about uh, monkeys and their their reaction to information. So there was there was um, an experiment where they had to choose between a bowl of food and water with some information information obviously about what they were about to receive, not information as we think humans, but anyway information. <laughs> uh, and they um, most of the times almost between eight. 80% and 100% of the times they would choose uh, um, the bowl that gave them also information. Even when the information wasn't necessary to get more food or to get any advantage. So it, it looks like from this study that even monkeys think that or uh, react as if information is important for them, for, for their lives, for their decisions, and also uh, apparently, it gives them kind of pleasure to have the information. So it's important to have the information, even if they're not going to do anything with the information. Because we could say, well, that's a human thing. We we want the information because we think that it will be useful for something. But apparently, it's not just a case of usefulness. It's also a case of reward. Because um, scientists uh, have come to the conclusion that the information uh, lights up uh, dopamine in, in the brain. I will show you um, in, in the next slide where, how, how does this go. Um, and, and dopamine is a sign of, uh, of, of reward. It's, 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 what, it's like a light coming up when uh, you do something that you like. Um, and this is what happened when, when monkeys had this uh, extra information, let us say so. So here I'm going to, uh, this, is, this was the, the basis of my, of my question. Uh, what happens to our brain when we read the text that follows a title like this? Schools closed because of bad weather. This won't cause me any emotion, unless it was like I mean, uh, weather that killed people or <laughs> if, it, if it was just, a rainy day, it wouldn't arouse, it wouldn't arouse me any uh, emotional impact. So it, it's like a, a white uh, blank uh, reaction. Uh, so I would say this is uh, hard news. And on the contrary, an example like in cold blood, uh, it would be um, yeah, literary journalism, journalism, obviously. And so. The, the question here is if these two situations uh, bring different reactions to the brain. Unfortunately, I don't have the complete answer, but I'm trying to find some, uh, some links to, to it. Um, one of the difficulties is that there are more than 80,000 studies on the brain, so it's, it's an incredible area being studied not like never before, but it's still the organ that scientists know the less of. So it's um, everything, every time they learn a little bit more, then they understand that it's, 
it's mostly about connections, and that makes it even harder to, to, to study. Um, but also some, some of the uh, researchers who work on this uh, seem to think that paying attention to literary texts requires the coordination of multiple complex cognitive functions, as I will show you next, uh, which means that all your brain is uh, working when you're read, reading a literary piece. Um, and this makes the immersion and all these reactions that uh, are important for literary reading. This is how it works in our, our brain. Uh, this, is, this slide is just to show that when we read, all our brain is, is working. So it, it, it's um, because scientists have sort of divided the brain um, in, in areas um, depending on what we are doing, reading or uh, hearing or eating, but um, all of them are lightened up when, when uh, there is immersive reading, understanding language, memory, hearing, so we use it all <laughs> to, to, make it, to make it short. Uh, this area is for emotional impact and speaking. And here is one of the answers I got from, from Raymond Marr, he's a, an investigator, a researcher that is working very hard on, the, on uh, cognitive effects and uh, psychologists' um, theories on the, on the, on the theory, of, theory of, of the mind. And he, um, he answered with this then that he would predict uh, that um, literary journalism could be considered as uh, literature in terms of brain reaction. Of course, this is um, like an hypothesis, but apparently it's, it's logical. It's not the same as reading uh, hard news as, as I was putting at first. So this is the, the complete <laughs> vision of it. And this uh, makes us uh, go to, to the question of emotion. That I think is, is the difference between reading hard news or literary journalism, or one of the differences, or one of the most important differences, is this one, is emotion. Because when we read literary journalism, it's as if we were reading fiction, and that is already a little bit studied. And uh, scientists know that uh, fiction uh, makes all this go on in our brain, and also, lightens up here the, the, the uh, amygdala. So uh, this means that um, emotions are, Park has an, an interesting study with Jane Austen uh, texts, um, and uh, scientists discovered that there was a very big increase in blood flow to regions of the brain beyond those responsible for, for executive, executive function. This means uh, executive, executive function is that you're reading, so that's uh, like a practical thing. But besides reading, when you read things like this, it lightens up other areas like the amygdala. So this is everything that is involved. And as I said before, I think uh, one of the most important things of this area is to understand more the link between emotion and um, the way we react to literary journalism. Okay, yes, so I'll make it faster. Um, I think maybe all of you already know this fiction. Uh, it was also told by the previous uh, um, talkers. Um, it, it makes us uh, more empathetic with others. Uh, more reading means more empathy. One of the studies I found really interesting was this one, because uh, if I, any one of us read more, apparently there, there, were, there were groups of children that they, they, they studied, 
And the ones who read more had more uh, empathy with, with what was going on with, with, with the other children and, and understood better what they felt and what they think about, about things. Watching movies did have the same effect, but it didn't happen the same with watching TV. I think this is really an interesting <laughs> difference. Uh, I think uh, if we think a little bit, um, we all feel it a little bit. It's different to watch TV or to go to the cinema. Uh, maybe we don't know exactly why, but we feel we feel a difference. We feel the, the movie in a different way, so apparently there's a, a, a scientific explanation. This has to do with um, deep reading, because deep reading uh, it's also already known by, by scientists, creates this immersion, uh, making the reader feel partially and temporarily isolated from the physical and temporal correlates of the real world. So it's, it's like as if you're outside the real world. And this is probably what makes the brain um, feel, I don't know if the brain feels, this is really difficult. Nobody really knows how it's going on. Just, just a small parenthesis. Uh, yeah, it's, I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it used, it used to be uh, considered by scientists until the 17th century that uh, everything was going on in our heart. The brain was nothing. It had no nothing to do with what to do, with what we decided, with what we could do with with, with ourselves. Everything was going on in, in, in the heart, is what they thought. So it's just to say that this is very new uh, that we are studying um, the brain in such deep. I'm, I'm going a little bit uh, faster because time is, time is running. So uh, just, this is, I'm almost finishing. Uh, there's also the, this issue of physicality. It's, it's also being studied, and this is very important for journalists, uh, the issue of the differences between reading paper or reading in a computer or on an iPad. And there are already some answers. The problem is there are uh, uh, different answers. Some studies say it's, it's different, it's, uh, or it has different reactions, exactly because when you read in an iPad, there's lots of distractions. You have to decide, you have to scroll up and down, and so it avoids the immersion, as when you're in, the, in paper, you, you can just forget about the world. But then there are other studies saying that maybe this is just a generation issue. If in a few years, probably uh, young, for young readers, there will be no difference. Maybe it's possible. If the brain is really an incredible machine, so it's, it's possible. <laughs> uh, this is more or less what I've answered. This, this is the controversy about this. There are different, um, so this is, these are the uh, main conclusions that you can read them out loud, um, <coughs> just maybe finishing that uh, this idea that the information uh, is maybe read differently in, in different uh, medium, the, the, the paper or the iPad, iPad, but also in different styles. It, it, makes, uh, uh, it makes a difference. It's not the same. I think we all know it as, as experience. Uh, we just don't have the scientific explanation yet, but uh, there are some interesting studies uh, being done, not specific, specifically with literary journalism, but with fiction. And as I said, uh, I think we can look at it uh, in terms of brain reaction as, as, a, as a parallel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is a study that I'm uh, conducting with uh, Francesca Dimitri from the University of North Carolina in Charleston. Um, and I was there last year as a visiting scholar, uh, thanks to a fellowship from the Dutch 
mention um, mention American education automation. And when I submitted um, the abstract, I thought I would be done by now with this, but uh, we're actually still working on it, so it's really a work in progress. The idea for this research uh, came from interviews I did uh, during my PhD with several American uh, journalists who defined their work as narrative journalism. Um, and I just put some quotes here. Um, I heard this idea uh, again and again. For example, Jackie Benashinsky was a reporter at the New um, St. Paul by the New York Press, uh, Press sorry, among others. Uh, and is now a professor of journalism, told me um, information without human context is an abstraction that I can easily ignore or not truly understand. Amy Aron from the New York Times said, I think that you absorb, absorb something more viscerally when your emotions are involved than when you are just told. Eli Saslow, reporter at the uh, Washington Post, um, said, I think people remember that more. I think it helps them understand an issue in ways they wouldn't just reading the numbers and the facts. So again and again, I heard this idea um, that narrative journalism allows reader to better remember and understand information. And I started to wonder, well, uh, is there a way to actually test this or start uh, testing this? Um, so, uh, following narrative journalists' assumptions, I had two hypotheses. Um, the first one being that readers remember uh, information better in the narrative format than in the interview journal format, and the second being that they understand informa uh, information better in that format. Considering that the journalists uh, I met, I interviewed, uh, mostly insisted on two features to define their work, uh, narrative journalism, I also wanted to explore the possible relation uh, between these features and information retention and comprehension. The first feature is the temporal organization uh, of the narrative, which creates tension systems for the reader, and the second is the experiential dimension of the narrative through which um, uh, readers adopt the perspective of the main character. So I also had two research questions. Um, to what extent, if any, is information retention associated, associated with experiencing suspense and or perspective taking while reading the news? And to what uh, extent is um, information comprehension may be associated to those two dimensions. Um, I'm not going, uh, I'm trying, I'm going to try not to go too much into details about the method, um, but enough so that you can understand what we actually did, because uh, it's kind of uh, different from most of what most of you uh, are doing. Uh, so with Francesca, who helped me design and conduct the study, we opted for um, social science experiments um, with a within subject experimental design, which basically means that um, we asked all our participants to read different texts uh, instead of having completely different uh, groups read uh, different texts each. Uh, and this kind of uh, design is usually considered better if you are looking for comparative judgment um, from participants, which was the case. So basically we created three stories, uh, all about health, but on different subtopics, uh, Huntington's disease, Asperger's syndrome, and uh, extremely premature babies. Um, these three stories were adapted from existing journalistic narrative uh, in order to increase their ecological viability. And for each story, we made two versions, <coughs> narrative and an inverted killing version. Um, the narrative versions were structured for, um, such that the character was first introduced within the context of a complicated, complicating event and was um, followed through resolution of this complication. The text emphasized uh, how uncertain the, re the resolution was and featured information about um, the character, what the character was thinking and feeling 
uh, and described the interactions uh, with other characters, uh, mostly from the main character's perspective. And in contrast, the inverted pyramid version um, began with a description of the health issue in general terms, and the character story was used later as an illustration of the issue, with less personal insight and more uh, direct focus. So just to give you um, an example, this is the beginning of the narrative version uh, of the story about Huntington. Uh, the text, the counselor said, had come back positive. Catherine Moser emailed shortly. She thought she was as ready as anyone could be to face her genetic destiny. And yet she realized in the, the moments she had never expected to hear those words. What do I do now? Catherine asked. What do you want to do? The counselor replied, cry, she said finally. Catherine was 23. It had taken her months to convince the clinic um, that she wanted at such a young age to find out whether she carried the gene for Huntington's disease. Um, this is the beginning of the inverted pyramid. An increasing number of young people are taking the DNA test for Huntington's disease, an incurable genetic brain disorder that makes, you, that makes patients progressively lose control over their body while at the same time ravaging their minds. Huntington's disease typically strikes in middle age until recently, researchers say. Most young adults who uh, know the disease runs in their family have avoided the tests that can tell whether they will get it preferring the torture and hope of not knowing. Um, so we varied the order of presentation of the different stories and uh, formats, and ended up with nine different conditions to which participants were uh, assigned randomly. Um, so for example, in the first condition, the participants had to read the narrative version of um, the text about Huntington, and the inverted pyramid uh, version of the text uh, around microfreemies and so on. After reading the two stories, participants were asked a few questions about their media habits and uh, their demographics, which we mainly use as control variables. Then we asked um, them to assess each story on different um, perception scales. So we asked them, uh, how, how much they liked each story, how informative they thought uh, each uh, story was. Uh, we also had a narrativity skills, uh, which consisted of uh, four items uh, assessing how much suspense they experienced and four items assessing how much they engaged in perspective taking with the main character. We asked them how much they knew about each topic uh, before reading the stories. This was again a control variable. And uh, how much uh, they felt they learned on each topic uh, thanks to the story. And finally, uh, we had five open-ended questions assessing their recall and uh, multiple choice questions assessing their comprehension. Uh, the participants were recruited online uh, through Quartix, uh, so that's very convenient. You send them your questionnaire and they do everything for, for you. Uh, we screened them to ensure that they were American residents with English as first language, just to make sure they had basic uh, language skills, uh, and that they were online news consumers as the experiment was online. So the final sample included 145 participants aged uh, 18 to 39, of which 61% were females. Um, and I'm just going to uh, present a few important results which highlight the importance of gender in the reading experience. So, the main analysis consisted in uh, several repeatable measures and other. Uh, so it's an analysis of the variance of the data and we used it to determine if um, there is a statistically significant effect of formats uh, on or different variables. Um, so for men, uh, we found a, a significant effect of formats on liking, suspense, and perspective taking. I'm not going to comment on all the, uh, I'm going to translate this. Um, and for women, we 
found only a uh, significant effect uh, on recall, and there was no effect uh, of format and comprehension. So what does that mean? It means that middle participants liked the narrative most, uh, more than the inverted pyramids. They felt more suspense reading it. Um, they experienced more perspective taking, but they didn't recall or understand information better in uh, any format. Women, on the other hand, didn't express any preference um, between the two formats, didn't feel more suspense, uh, um, more perspective taking uh, with any format, <coughs> didn't understand information better in any format, but had a better recall um, with narrative than with the inverted pyramids. We also found, uh, when comparing the scores of female, and male on these different variables that uh, women um, consistently scored uh, higher than men for uh, both formats. Uh, so they liked the story more, they felt more suspense, they engaged more in perspective taking, recalled more, uh, and understood better whatever the format. So very quickly, um, these results are consistent with research in education, uh, in which females consistent consistently outperform uh, men on reading tasks. There are also a few studies uh, that have already investigated the influence of news format on recall, but they yielded uh, mixed results. And there's an interesting uh, study in journalism that suggests that women engage with texts the same way, no matter the story format. Um, there's still a lot of questions that we are uh, asking ourselves, like, why do only men feel more suspense and perspective taking with narratives, and yet only women have a better recall with it? Uh, are these results uh, only valid for stories about health, or can they be generalized to other topics? But uh, as I told you, we're still working on this. I just wanted to share the very first results. <laughs> I had, first, I loved every single presentation today. It was really very good, and they were very complimentary. Um, I wanted to first ask Kate um, if you've ever heard of the concept of plant blindness in science. There is actually a scientific concept that humans are more um, apt to identify with and understand animals, particularly creatures with faces, than plants. And there are scientific articles written about it. One of my environmental journalism students, who's a botanist, wrote a story about it. So that might be something that's good to look into. Um, also, um, with regard to Kate and Lindsay's talking about empathy and, some, and the brain and how the brain processes things, there's a neurological system called mirror neurons. I don't know if any of you have heard about them. Yes that seem to suggest that there is a neurological basis for empathy. Um, if you reach for something, certain neurons fire, but if you watch someone reach for the same thing, this, your neurons will fire in response to watching them. And it, it's still a fairly new area, but um, it does suggest there might be some basis for empathy or feeling what other people, other creatures feel. So anyway, I just, I really like them all. Oh, the other thing is about the, the amygdala. The amygdala attaches emotional tags to information, which could underlie um, imagination. You know, when we recall those memories and they have emotional tags um, attached, we can use our imagination then to recreate the experience. Anyway, I just thought they were great, really enjoyed them. <laughs> Oh, I didn't mean to go off on a lecture, but I just was really excited by all of them. Thanks for the panel. Uh, very um, illuminating. Uh, I have a question for Marie. Oh, oh, I, as I understand, you, uh, the team created, produced the, uh, the stories, right? There were not stories that were uh, poached from the media. Yeah, they were adapted from stories. Uh, that were actually published. Why did you decide to, to do that instead of just uh, bringing stories that were on the same topic, narrative, 
and, uh, and, and actual stories from yeah. India. Because we need to make them exactly equivalent uh, on the information level in order to compare the scores of readers. So um, when you try with social uh, science experiments, you have to find a balance between the validity of the experiments and you have a lot of um, criteria uh, to, to ensure this validity and the ecological validity of the stimuli you're using. Um, After so adapting those stories, then, did you make them, did you check them with the journalists that produced those stories to make sure that they were um, correctly <coughs> formulated? Uh, we didn't check them with the journalists who wrote them, um, but journalists reread the stories and said, yeah, this is in very current. Yeah, just for, I, I think that that could raise some um, questions regarding w what is the origin of, what are the source material, and whether the stories conform to an actual inverted pyramid that you would read in yeah. the news, or to, an, or to a solid um, um, narrative story yeah. too. So that, that could, I, I think that I would, I don't know, I, I would question, I, I would try to. So journalists read the stories and said, yeah, this this is a narrative. This is an inverted pyramid that you could actually find in in, mm -hmm. in a publication. And Kate, um, I have a short um, question. Yeah. Um, so, you personification and uh, prosopopeia. Uh, do you do you see? Is there any difference for you, or they are the same thing? Between personification and anthropomorphism, yeah. Um, because there's there's human personas and not non human personas. That's true. So. I, there and. Um, for the purposes of this uh, presentation, I wasn't making any difference between the two. And I also found that people will often talk about anthropomorphism. There were many questions that came up uh, to these journals and interviews I saw, for example, where they were asked about the anthropomorphism in their work, but technically what they were asking about was personification and not anthropomorphism. So that's one is a biological uh, category and the other one's a legal category. The, the uh, pers pers persons are, are, are Legal, uh, it's a legal category. Um, so, for instance, you can determine the, the personhood of a river or the personhood of a corporation, like in the United States. Mm -hmm. But you cannot make the river be a human being, <laughs> for no, because it, it is not. So, there there may be some nuances there that could be uh, interesting to explore. I love trees. <laughs> this, this city got hit, hit on by uh, a top rank or fifth rank uh, hurricane 10 years ago, and we lost millions of trees in New Brunswick. And I was writing a column in the paper in those days, and uh, among other things, described trees as our friends during the <laughs> serious heat. <laughs> so, um, I read this book, I was given this book as a gift um, Secret Life of Trees. And it made me desperately uncomfortable the whole way through. Yeah. Partly because all of this emotive language suckling, et cetera, and lots of examples, I couldn't help but think, people who, partly who's gonna buy this book or give this book as gifts? Only people who are already on side. So you're only preaching, preaching the choir, I think, I think. And I, and I think you're, it's opening up that everybody who doesn't call trees our friends, it just gives them more ammunition to make fun of us and maybe move them further away from seeing trees as worth anything but money. And that really concerns me and I felt, I still feel, when you, and I saw it on the thing, I don't want to go back, because so I felt queasy still. Do you, in your research, you're thinking about this, do you have any concerns about how perception of this might actually backfire from what the author wants? Sure. I, I think that if you are someone who um, is really concerned about that boundary between um, empirical and poetic language, or, um, or uh, well, yeah, if, if, if this boundary, if you are someone who knows that it's well policed, then it is extremely uncomfortable. And I, I, there are certain points in the book where he also says, one could say it is like blah, blah, blah. So he, he will distance himself from making that direct metaphor, but he 
he, I think, also tries pretty explicitly to say, we're not actually being metaphorical here. I'm merely translating what the science is telling us. And that's why I also wanted to include that um, comment from Dr. Suzanne Simar, who's the forest ecologist who's done research. She wants to say that this is actually what he's doing with his language is merely saying what the science already tells us. Um, which perhaps you are uncomfortable also with the, with the science, that, um, that you would want to say that the trees actually have a memory. Um, but this is what these forest ecologists are finding right now. They say, well, it's not that as if they have memory, but that they actually have memory. Um, I don't know if that was that. Uh, Were you surprised? Was I surprised? Were you surprised that the reviews from the New York Review of Books, et cetera, were so positive? Everything was positive, and that really surprised me. And um, I think what, for me, what was uncomfortable with the book is coming from a literary background. It's, it just seems cheesy. It seems kind of tacky. It's, um, it sort of violates the sort of um, uh, elevated poetics in, in, in a literary sense. But uh, I don't know if this came across in what I was saying with the, um, the aesthetic experience of reading and understanding this information. I think this this feeling of awe, that oh my god, a tree has memory, or um, a tree can count, or a tree um, can recognize its saplings, that this was the thing that uh, impressed everyone in the reviews. You know, that, and he was able to communicate that through a more um, person or a language of personification. He was able to, uh, to translate <coughs> what the science, what the research has been showing. Um, Lindsay, I don't think this is really a question. I think I just want to thank you for putting me into a place where I'm now wrestling with something that I thought I'd kind of come to terms with. Was it, was it Green? <laughs> thank you. Was it Green was saying when you're reading fiction that somehow you're safer in that, that space to kind of, you know, feel empathy because it's not a real situation. You don't actually have to change something. Is, yeah, that's right. But then literary journalism that perhaps that draws you back and makes you more reticent because oh look it's a bit it's a bit scary it's it's a bit real and I, I wonder if they and, and this is the thing this is where I'm really wrestling with it I'm you know are they mutually exclusive or can they both because I would yeah I would say with journalism and you know from obviously you know like you know from the white paper with frenetics I'm saying that's that's the point it, makes you, you know, it confronts you with that, that power of the... Uh... Yeah, no, it's a double-edged sword. Actually, the best yeah. person in the building to talk to about this is Matthew Richardson. He's in My new boss. Your new nice. boss. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, should do that. Note yourself. written extensively about this. It's, <coughs> yeah. it's the whole really suspension of disbelief in, in fiction. Yes. Um, I, I don't know if you've read Lost in a Book by yeah. Nell. Yeah, so it's that whole thing of um, inviting inviting a reader into an immersive experience. So yeah. I actually do suspend um, critical, I suppose, a critical yes. um, uh, perspective on, on whatever they're reading. And he's written quite extensively about a number of ethical issue, issues that that um, triggers. But what was really interesting about Suzanne Keen is um, she's... she's um, worked with a number of, of people um, looking at, at their responses to fiction mm. and um, there's absolutely no predicting how a person will respond. Um, I was just telling Kate, I'm working through um, <laughs> 1200, it's ridiculous, I understand, but about 1200 um, reviews of um, Adrian the Congo Blank um, Rankin family at the moment. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if you guys are, are familiar with that, but it is polarizing, and it's polarizing in terms of style. Some people are, are absolutely enthralled by, um, you know, it, it's a fairly objective, I suppose, by a wall. She tries to hide her own persona. Other people got through to the first five pages and said, I cannot read this, I will not read this. Um, so style and immersion, um, it's, there's no formula to predict it at all. Yes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because this was going to be a conversation I thought I could have with you with wine over dinner, but I know you're not well, so you're probably <laughs> not going to be there. So thank you. I'll keep wrestling. Good. Uh, 
Thank you guys. Thank you all for asking. Um, it's a pleasure as a priest by a reading of it. I um, just every week feeling um, kind of just referred to this at the beginning. Why, why are cover thirds still so resistant to use this kind of these kinds of techniques? Because I think I'm a practicing journalist and I think that um, I should go in the other direction. Exactly. <laughs> so, um, if, you know, this is so, I mean, this sort of had some temporary you know, material, but well, why do you think that uh, there's so much? This is, oh, you stick to me with the camera that is shorter and shorter. Well, um, for a start, I think it's more expensive to do that narrative journalism, and one of the main issues nowadays is the uh, um, uh, well, money, the economic uh, sustainability of has it to do with narrative or non-narrative, I mean, it should have in the meantime, but at first it didn't have to do with that, it has to do with the free, the free information that you can get everywhere, but this free information is the same in 21 places, it has no um, critical views most of the time, or not <coughs> as, as many as you could find in, 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 in other uh, Systems of, 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 uh, I don't like to say before it was bad. It's not it's not to say this because uh, it's good that people can have information and information free. And uh, but the problem is that we we're getting more and more information and we're less and less informed. That this is really a problem because you have lots of information, the same kind of information. You're getting less different information, less different perspectives. Uh, because from, and I'll talk about my experience as a journalist, what's going on is that we are all doing the same, on the same perspective, mm -hmm. on the same way. Uh, and this has to do with lots of things. One of, one, one of it is the, the, the business model. No one has an answer for the business model. Um, but it's not obviously, cannot be the only thing, but it's one of the things. And I, I'm also at the board of the Union Journalists in Portugal, so I'm, I'm very aware of what is going on. Every month there's more journalists unemployed. Uh, the, the conditions at work are worse. Um, but I believe that this is, uh, a period. Someone told in the other in the other room uh, and the table before uh, that uh, uh, these periods then help make better journalism. It happened before that there was a time of crisis and then <laughs> it got better. So I'm I'm a person with hope. So I, I hope I hope this is what will happen. But at the moment, uh, it is really a problematic. Situation. So it's actually financial reasons having to devote the time or the space. I would say, but I, you know, uh, it's that's uh, that's the materialistic, and then we, it's easier because then there's other things like uh, the fact that journalists are being so badly treated and uh, earning so so little and being unemployed and so on and so on. It makes us powerless, and that makes other powers more powerful, so, <laughs> you know? And I think that that, that may be a real problem because uh, we, we are supposed to work on the balance, right? Uh, help society be more balanced and powerless and more powerful, and that's one of the jobs of journalists. <laughs> so, um, but, well, it's that, that point is more difficult to, uh, to prove than, than the, uh, the materialistic and the money one, you know? The money one, ev everybody knows and it's, it's pretty obvious. The other one is more subjective, it's more difficult. But I don't know if, if I helped anything, but if I had the, the answer, uh, I would be a very, very happy person. <laughs> because I really love my, my, my work as a journalist and it's really hard now, nowadays. Yeah, um, two things. Uh, first, uh, 
it looks like a question that maybe is a suggestion for you if you my question is, do you know, do you know the article Journalism and the Power of Emotion? Mm -hmm. That's published by like a Columbia Journalism Review. Mm -hmm. And this was I was I was introduced to this subject. And I think it's amazing because it justifies the importance of what I, we what we are doing. Um, in the idea of empathy, um, motivating to action, and how can narrative journalists contribute uh, in comparison to traditional journalists. And the other thing is uh, this uh, question about uh, economic models. Actually, there are a lot of media uh, enterprise now who work with this idea of engagement mm -hmm. as a way of surviving. And I know a, com a comic journalist, his name is uh, John Archer. He founded a enterprise called Empathetic Media, and the idea is to offer for newspaper or website um, reportage with uh, virtual reality or uh, with this idea of imagination. What's the name associated with that? Empathetic Media? Yeah, the journalist. Don Archer. Don Archer. E O N? E O N? Dan. No, Dan. 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 Dan Archer. Great, thank you. He knows the cover that picture. So it's, it's kind of a related question to it. And because Lindsay, Lindsay, what do you make of the label based on a true story um, uh, attached to a movie? <laughs> 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 well, I haven't explored this difference of uh, responses to imagination as much as you have. That's why I'm curious. I mean, I, 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 I have an idea. But... Um, can I ask you just to ask like, a, bit, a bit more specific? What do I make of it in what sense? Um, in terms of why it's, why it's there or why something like that even, even exists. Um, because you were talking about the, the, the difference between fiction and non-fiction, and, yeah. and, um, and this is an obvious blurring, uh, right, in a way, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, I, I use the phrase, the nebulous power of non-fiction, and that's really what got me into this. I, so many of the practitioners and theorists I read talk about the fact that non-fiction has a power that fiction doesn't necessarily have. So my direct answer to your question would be, a, would be that, that that phrase, based on a true story, is trading on the power of non-fiction. Mm -hmm. But a better, a, well not a better question, a different question is, well, what is that power? And what I hope I've shown in my paper is that um, Suzanne Keen has, 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 has demonstrated that as yet there's no, there's no, um, evidence to support the empathy altruism theory in fiction but I think well I'm curious to know has, has anyone here been so moved by the power of a non-fiction text that it's moved you to action has anyone acted yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Into some, well the first step is changing attitude but as I've defined it in my paper is actually taking pro-social enacting a pro-social behavior. Um, and that, that, I mean, that's a, a real range of things. But again, we've, we've, we've looked at it. There are a number of um, cases that I've mentioned and that Kate's talked about that um, people, their attitude hasn't just changed, but in fact, it has moved them to do something. So I'd say trading on the power of non-fiction would be the answer to that, which I don't always think is a bad thing, by the way. Um, but, but once again, we really need to be careful about the stories we tell them, the way we tell them, and the reasons we tell them. Can I just add one thing to, uh, to help <laughs> with your question? I think that that, well, that sentence is obviously to sell more, and uh, what we know it's, it's, that it's effective. And what I think it happens is that on those situations, people work like in both ways. I mean, they have. Uh, fiction, text, or film, or whatever, so it, it will uh, cause you more emotion because it will be uh, done in this uh, uh, narrative way, so it, it pushes you. 
And at the same time, you say, this happened, this really happened, this person really died, or this person, you know? So it, it's like putting together yeah. the best of two worlds. <laughs> and this is why, I think this is why it's so often chosen. Yeah. That's, uh, then you have that sentence, and afterwards you have a, uh, something saying, this has nothing to do with reality, we just, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I find really Once again, amusing. <laughs> what I think about that, but she, she says that, um, and, um, but I, I wonder if there is an implicit, an implicit mm. request to act in non-fiction, even if it's not advocacy, um, you know, a, a work of advocacy, um, just because yeah. it's, it's real. Yeah, but you know um, the, um, Daniel Lemon's book? Um, Matter of Fact. Uh, yeah, Matter of Fact, really not. So he talks in there about how I'm on a kind of connected with um, Pascal's question, it's something like memoir, but that might even be where the line is more, even more, where it's not sort of the, where it's remembered in the end. So it's kind of, it's, it's one step removed from, say, the, the directly observed or directly recorded, but rather it's the, re the remembered report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to think about I find it very reassuring because I was sort of educated with the idea that the study of humanities or being involved in the humanities doesn't make people more humane. You know, and the great examples of that were the, the incredible cultural richness of um, Russia pre the Soviet era and, and Germany before the Nazi era. And the, the two areas of Europe that were so culturally rich ended up with such horrendous mass cruelty, you know, and, and, and that was sort of something that was drummed into us that we couldn't rely on the arts for social change, you know. So I'm sort of fascinated by this line of empathy leading to action, and I'm sort of, um, I don't know if I have a question about it, but I'd, I'd would like to reconcile to the point. Kim talks about it in her book. She, she absolutely brings up um, yeah. actually those exact examples. Um, and then she, she goes on at length to talk about how empathy can also have really negative social um, behavioural outcomes as well. She talks about pornography, for example, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and talks about how um, uh, negative you know, social acts in, in text. People also can identify with protagonists or or yeah, empathise yeah, with, yeah. with, you know, empathise with the bad guy. Um, so uh, this is another reason that she's really, really um, uh, hesitant to um, to say that the, this hypothesis is actually a um, a beneficial thing. Yeah. If it's a thing satire like is another area where you know that that studies keep showing that what's meant to be satirised, people identify with. Yeah. Really yeah. Um, yeah. There I would make a difference between empathise and identifies. Yes. Because mm -hmm. empathise, it means you feel what the other person is feeling. Yeah. It's not happening to you. And there's lots of studies that you, you feel the pain of mm -hmm. someone uh, just because you see the person is in pain. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's different. And the identification is something, it can come together, but it's something that probably happens more in political situations, because of propaganda, for instance, that comes with the idea of identification. Like we are all blonde, yeah, yeah, or yeah. we are all white, and we all look like this. It's, <laughs> you know, I think uh, that distinction, I think I'll think about your Question and, and Marie. Uh, I wonder if both texts are, are studying the hard information, the news, and the 
uh, reportage or a journalist literary and both style uh, have the same space <coughs> because uh, at least um, the problem between uh, both styles are, are the, the space. We, we read news because we don't have more, uh, more time or uh, if, if we have more time we write a large reportage of the same uh, item or issue. Um, the news, I think that is uh, it's, it's not an option, it's a condition, because you don't, you don't have more space, in, for example, in the newspaper. If you have more space, you choice um, write a, a great reportage or um, a chronicle. So for the purpose of the experiments, the text had the same length. Uh, that's, again, a criterion. If you have two needs um, for the experience, you uh, add. Uh, so there was a huge debate with Francesca. Uh, I, I came with a question and she came with a method. And um, yeah, we had a discussion about this because I wanted the text to be longer and to be closer to existing journalistic narratives. Uh, we ended up um, around 1,200 words, uh, which is already considered as long form uh, online. Um, and again, that's just um, to make the experiment work. Uh, but um, the, we didn't ask participants to read the text until the end. We just said, you're going to read two stories, and we didn't tell them that they were going to be recalled or understanding questions after. So the time they engaged with the text was just their own. Um, choice, and we could see that they engaged uh, less with the inverted experiments, so they stayed longer with the narrative. Um, one of the big questions we're wondering about is the role of motivation. Uh, maybe narrative does have an effect on readers, but with readers who are already interested in that format, with people who like to read, uh, and basically that's not all the readers you're going to you're going to find online, so uh, that's another thing we have to explore. Do you think sure. that's on paper or online? Online. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, brilliant. I mean, this is a fantastic panel. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to, um, Lizzie, this is a question for you. And I, I know I'm going to do that thing, and I'm running the risk of doing the thing where I, um, I say, like, yeah, but have you considered my research? And I'm, not, I'm trying not to do that. <laughs> but have you considered that? <laughs> I think there's, I wonder if you, if you looked at, um, the, my sense is there's a long history of this um, in literary journalism. If we look at the origins of literary journalism um, being sentimentalism in the 19th century, because there was this sort of like writing that was intentionally um, focused on trying to cause reform, and it was trying to do that by sort of enacting um, sort of empathetic feelings in readers. And so, you know, I, I don't have a sense of the scope of your of your research, and if you're looking at sort of, um, sort of this happening in recent publications, or if you, if you do sort of have to you know, look at that, the whole sort of breadth uh, of the history of, of literary journalism. Well, I'm just starting at the moment um, and looking at contemporary literary journalism, but super interested if you've, if you've got a more historical yeah, let's, yeah, I'd be happy to talk a little bit more yeah. about that because I think that uh, it, you can make a really cool case that like it, it's there, it's always there. Yeah. You know, it's always there. Sure, uh, to connect Lindsay and, and Kate asking, thinking about action um, and personification, and we've talked a bit about Catherine Schultz, the really big one, um, as well as some other um, kind of exploring the Cascadia fault line and this big mega quake that's going to happen. And that piece is actually an act of legislative change. Um, there's been a movement once that was published. Um, so, it, you know, the effects are evident. It's happening right now. Um, and then I wanted to ask Isabel a question with neuroscience and literary journalism. Have you looked into audio born literary journalism and the varying differences between listening to a narrative rather than reading one? Mm -hmm. Well, not, not in depth, but you know, I know there are 
some some studies uh, on it's also interesting. Um, it would be interesting to know if they uh, activate this, the same areas uh, or not. I, um, I, yeah, no, it's interesting. It, it would be interesting to, to know that, but um, I'm guessing that the issue is not exactly if it is hearing or reading, it's if you're, there's an immersion in, 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 in the issue, in the, in the topic. In the, I think that that's it, because if you think of that example where children um, were engaged in stories, like uh, children's stories, in movies, but not in, um, not when watching TV. I think that apparently that may uh, mean that it's not the medium, but the way you, you give the stories that makes a difference, you know? Uh, so maybe in audio, if it's done also in a narrative way, audio, but in a narrative way, I would say, I, mean, and I, I, I think there's even less studies of that. There are studies on music, lots of studies on music and the brain reaction to music and the emotions that it arises. Um, but I don't, that, for instance, hearing the news on the radio, that it, I, I don't know if there are studies about that, if, if it makes a difference. Probably does because there it's more quick and I don't know. It's, uh, it's interesting. It's very interesting. <laughs> there could be answers <laughs> for that for that too. Maybe if, if, if you look up audio and, and brain reaction. No, I'm just no. Okay, no, no, no. Maybe you already years. knew more than me. This is <laughs> just asking. Right, and we've been listening to narratives for thousands of years, like you're saying. Yeah, well, exactly, and, exactly. And, and, and yet now, there's this sort of this, we were just talking about on the other panel, about clone and retrieval, there's a retrieval of that oral storytelling tradition mm -hmm. through podcasting, mm -hmm. which is you know, skyrocketing among millennial audiences, particularly online. And you know, platforms like Gimlet, for example, and this is you know well beyond serial, you know, which is ancient history, right? At this point, you know, the NPR masterpiece of, of podcasting, but there's been you know, many more outlets that have opened up to try to replicate that narrative line, and no research is untouched. You know, nobody's done any brain research on that. I wanted to throw in too. There is a work by a fellow named Brenton Mallon called "Feeling Mediated." Um, not to be confused with feeling medicated, <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, um, it, it talks about the scientific measurement of human reaction to media, um, whether it's it's reading or video or whatever, and um, really gets into sort of what the limitations of the scientific toolbox are, and specifically that it elides a lot of the greater political, social, and economic questions in the context around it. Um, and so that's sort of a cautionary uh, study, as it were. But I, I want to say NYU 2014, something like that. So very recent piece. Can I just add to that that um, I remember one thing that goes with what you were saying. Uh, when uh, stories started to be told written, writtenly, there was also a controversy. People at that time, uh, intellectuals at that time would say, well, this is not going to be the same as telling. People will not feel the stories the same way, and this will be lost. And It'll ruin our memories, right? It will ruin, ruin our collective memory and so on. So, uh, <laughs> I mean, I think it's, stories always makes an impact, um, regardless of the medium, I think, maybe you could get that conclusion. Squeeze in one more, or okay. Give it a